I've always had a fascination with ghost towns. And over the years when I worked in television news, I think I did three or four series on Oregon ghost towns. The first one was with the guy who's shooting this right now, Bill Getz. We started at Shanico and worked our way east and we called it Lost and Found Oregon Ghost Towns. We now have a deal we've worked out with the University of Oregon, with the Archives Department and the Libraries and the Special Collections, and we're going to be airing some of those old stories we did on KEZI. So we thought, what better place to start than with one of our favorites? So here's the beginning of Lost and Found Oregon Ghost Towns. Well, the words are somehow irresistible. Ghost Town. Somehow the sound of it beckons us the ghost town. The words promise a trip into the shadowy world of the Old West. It's not just the tourists who are finding it hard to stay away. A new generation is turning to these relics of the past in search of a future in a simpler world. There are more than 40 ghost towns in Oregon. For the next three nights, photographer Bill Getz and I will take you on a visit to six of these lonely towns. They stand in mute testimony to pioneer courage, hardship, and sometimes broken dreams. It's almost as if the weathered boards of empty buildings are too stubborn to admit they've been abandoned. And in your mind's eye, it's not too hard to see the buckboards on the streets or hear the music from the old dance hall. We know it wasn't really that romantic back in the days of the early settlers. You worked hard and got little for it. But as Jerry Myers remembers, life was simpler. His kinfolk homesteaded near Sumter in the Blue Mountains of Eastern Oregon way back in 1878. And he thinks simplicity is the magnet that attracts visitors to these parts. They're looking for the atmosphere. You know, uh, they read the history is a real big thing now. And people come in here and kind of feel it touch it, see it. Because in those days, we worked hard for what we had, and we enjoyed what we had to the ultimate. Uh, we, we've just kind of gotten away from that, and I think people are really looking to get back to that. They'd, they'd like to get a little bit closer to things. Originally, though, it was gold fever, timber, wool, and the railroad that brought dreamers to live in these isolated valleys and hillsides. Looking at what's left of some of these towns, this was born. You can hardly believe that at one time several thousand people lived here. Saloons, hotels, stores, and homes covered the hillside just below the old mines. The old timers say the pioneers found what they were looking for. Times were good, at least for a while. But eventually the gold was too costly to mine, the railroads pulled up and relocated, and there was no way to ship the timber or the wool. The glitter in places like granite was beginning to fade. Now it's solitude that attracts residents. Tony Thompson runs the granite general store. But you have to be hardy. You have to be willing to work hard. You pay a price for living up here. It's hard economically. It's uh, hard physically. I mean, just keeping your house in shape, going through the winters we go through. Uh, just all those things, you know, you, you work at it. You don't just come up here and kick back and, oh, well, no problem, I'll just take it easy. That doesn't happen. When the railroad pulled out of Shanico, the townsfolk walked away, leaving the city to the tumbleweeds and the sun and the wind. The outside world kept changing. Shanico just waited, slowly becoming a museum of our past. 
its legacy as a ghost town starting to take shape. Filled with wool. They stacked wool in here from, uh, I guess they come clear from the, Alif the California border. Now, blacksmith Ron Owens meets lots of people who just stop by to look, listen, and talk about how it must have been. People say, uh, uh, oh, we, we wished we, I wished I could, I wished I could live back in them, in them, in the days that, uh, when they had this, uh, back in 1911, you know, when they were in the shooting and all the fighting was going on, and, and there was a lot of that. And, uh, back when there was 13 saloons and five hotels in town, you know, and two or three thousand people, and it must have been pretty exciting. But a ghost town doesn't have to be old to capture our attention. There's the unconventional ghost town of Rajneesh Param. Five years ago, thousands of people lived and worked here for the glory of their guru. Now an insurance company owns the town, but it's home to only a caretaker and his family. Ghost towns are a little sad, lonely outposts of our past. But they're no longer just monuments to bad times and broken dreams. The new pioneers have found them and are opening them back up for all of us. And tomorrow night we will look back at some of the history of some of these eastern Oregon ghost towns. And get your flashlights ready. We're going to take you 600 feet inside of a mine shaft and search for gold. Thanks, Rick.